There are known knowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns. There are also unknown knowns. We are the ancient and esoteric order of the Jackalope, a secret society devoted to unearthing and sharing this forgotten knowledge. Today's Lodge meeting is brought to you by Podcast Network. We have a plan for making money off this, somehow, someday. Until then, there is safety in numbers. We huddle together for security, for warmth, to hide from the cold and the wolves and the slowly encroaching darkness. Podcast Network. Try it, won't you? Today's presentation, That No Man Take Thy Crown, The Harmony Society, Part 2, presented by number 13. Just a quick reminder that this is Part 2 of a two-part story. If you haven't listened to our previous episode, Hold Fast What Thou Hast, Here's What You Missed. In 1804, German prophet George Rapp and his followers moved to western Pennsylvania and established themselves as the Harmony Society, a communistic and celibate religious community which became famous for its industriousness and thrift. In 1815, the society moved to Indiana so they could have room to expand, but ultimately failed to attract new members and moved back to Pennsylvania. Then, the society was torn asunder by a German conman claiming to be a dispossessed noble and the messiah who poached everyone dissatisfied with Rapp's leadership. Rapp himself passed away in 1847, which is where we pick up today. After Rapp's death, the Harmony Society's Council of Elders realized that the society would need to reorganize in order to survive. Looking back, they realized the community was at its absolute best when leadership had been split between George and Frederick Rapp. They decided from now on the society would be managed by two trustees, and chose Romelius Baker to manage the society's business interests and Jacob Henrizzi to tend to their spiritual needs. Romelius Baker was a lifelong member of the society and one of their most zealous and devoted members. Jacob Henrizzi, on the other hand, was a convert. In 1825, newly arrived in Baltimore from Germany, he heard of the Harmony Society and their holy mission and resolved to walk to Indiana to join them. When he arrived in Pittsburgh, he learned the society had moved back to Pennsylvania and rushed to economy to present himself. He was soon employed as a teacher, educating the children of society members in their hired hands. The community was swayed by his gentle spirit, piety, and devotion, and soon he was granted membership in the society and became one of George Rapp's closest friends and advisors. Henrizzi was also deeply in love with Gertrude Rapp, George's granddaughter, and she with him. Their faith, though, was so strong that during their 70-year friendship, neither violated their vows of celibacy. Baker and Henrizzi's co-trusteeship got off to a rocky start. Henrizzi felt he should have the ability to preach as he saw fit, just as Rapp did. Baker and the Council of Elders felt differently. Not that they thought Henrizzi was going to go off the reservation, mind you, they just wanted to approve an outline of his sermons in advance. An indignant Henrizzi nearly quit the society then and there, but he was eventually persuaded to stay on. The incident made it clear that, although there were two trustees, Baker was in charge. He quickly proved to be an able manager. The Panic of 1837 and the resulting depression made it very difficult for the society to obtain capital and loans to upgrade their increasingly obsolete industrial machinery. Additionally, society members were aging past their prime working years and were having difficulty working the existing machines. Completely staffing the mills with outsiders did not sit well with the society's stated goal of self-reliance, and by the late 1850s, the textile mills of economy were silent. Baker's solution to this crisis was to redirect the society's energies from industrial production to investment. The society invested heavily in businesses throughout western Pennsylvania, including manufacturing, mines, and railroads. They were even involved in the Pennsylvania oil rush, establishing some of the earliest wells near Titusville, Pennsylvania. These investments proved to be lucrative, and soon the society had more money than it knew what to do with. Locals eventually even used the phrase, rich as an economite, to refer to the very wealthy. The astronomical returns meant that few of the society actually had to work, although most of them still did household and agricultural chores simply to stay busy, though their advancing ages meant that many of them just did the easy chores while outside hands did most of the strenuous tasks. Uh, As usual, the situation was completely baffling to outsiders. The society had money to rival the richest Wall Street tycoons, but its individual members lived like humble peasants, or perhaps were only play-acting as humble peasants. Though Baker was a wise investor, he was also a zealot, harsh and unforgiving by nature. The trials and tribulations of the previous two decades had forged him into a sharp weapon to be aimed at the society's enemies. A number of the new Philadelphians readmitted to the society in 1848 were forced to sign contracts allowing the elders to discipline them with corporal punishment if they strayed in the future. And for those who did not rejoin, well, Baker made their lives a living hell. Take the cases of Jacob Wagner and Joshua Nocturne. Jacob Wagner had left the society to join the new Philadelphians because he wanted to have a family. 
He also had a rich uncle, John Huber, who had died and left generous bequests to his nieces and nephews. Now, Huber did not like George Rapp or the Harmony Society and had expressed a desire that the money should not be paid out to anyone who was still a member of the society. Wagner, as the executioner of Huber's will, tried to honor his uncle's wishes and withheld the money from the other heirs, putting it in a trust for safekeeping. Unfortunately, Huber had died in Teston, and so his desires were not legally enforceable. The money technically belonged to the other heirs, or rather, to the Harmony Society, to which they had previously assigned all their personal property. Baker ambushed Wagner in a Pittsburgh courtroom and had the ex-member arrested and thrown in jail until the bequests were paid out. Now, Baker was within his rights to demand the payments, but he had chosen the most aggressive and hostile way to assert those rights. Wagner, justifiably upset, started bad-mouthing Baker to anyone who would listen. Baker upped the ante by suing Wagner for libel, eventually winning a $900 judgment in court. And if Baker treated Jacob Wagner poorly, he treated poor Joshua Nocturne abominably. Nocturne had been a loyal society member for years. At one point, he was selected for jury duty. During his travels, he ran into some old friends who had left the society with the New Philadelphians and wanted to talk about what was going on back in economy. Nocturne gave them a polite brush off, but did agree to meet them again later for a friendly chat. In a small community like Economy, though, word gets around. George Rapp soon learned what had happened and tried to expel Nocturne for talking to outsiders without prior permission. Now, Nocturne did not want to leave, but he eventually was convinced to leave by the Council of Elders under false pretenses. He was led to believe that it was only a temporary leave of absence from the society and not a total withdrawal. But the elders at the time also made him sign a binding legal document without giving him a chance to properly review it. It clearly stated he was resigning from the society and would get a one-time payment of $200. Now, when Nocturne found out he'd been deceived, he was furious. He sued the society, claiming it had been forcibly expelled and deserved to be readmitted or at least get a larger payout for all he'd contributed over the years. Now, the society had a three-pronged defense. First, they said, we didn't expel him. We have an affidavit he signed saying he left voluntarily and which was not at all obtained under fraudulent pretenses. Second, so what if we did expel him? We're a religious trust, and as such, our property is indivisible, and he's only entitled to what we have given him out of the goodness of our own hearts. And finally, even if we're not a trust, that dirty deserter is only entitled to a share of what the society was worth when he joined, not what it's worth now. Now, Pennsylvania courts were not persuaded at all by these arguments, which, though clever, were unbecomingly vindictive for what's supposedly a religious society. They found for the plaintiff, awarding him $3,890 plus legal fees. Baker, though, would not let that stand. He appealed the case all the way to the United States Supreme Court, who in 1856 reversed the Pennsylvania courts on the ground that, well, Nocturne signed a piece of paper, and let's not interfere too much with the free exercise of religion. It was a bad decision. But what was more galling was that the society's legal defense cost more than it would have cost to pay off Nocturne in the first place. Baker, once again, could have resolved matters amicably, but chose to be as vindictive as humanly possible. He wanted his enemies defeated and humiliated, and cost was no object. The case did force the society to produce one of the first complete accountings of their finances, though, and that revealed they held about $1 million in assets, or about $32 million in today's money. Of course, there was also the Benjamin Feucht incident. Benjamin Feucht was the son of Conrad Feucht and Hildegard Mutchler, who you may remember from our previous episode. Boist was the society's physician and had long been groomed to assume a trusteeship. In 1865, he disappeared for a few days, only to return with a brand new wife. It seems Benjamin had fallen to the same carnal impulses that had entrapped his parents, and like them, he expected to be forgiven and welcomed back. Well, he had miscalculated badly. When his parents had been readmitted to the society, celibacy was a relatively new custom, but by 1865 it had been established for over half a century. His father and mother had George Rapp personally pleading on their behalf, and the effort taxed even the prophet's powers. Anyone who would have been inclined to forgive Benjamin for his transgressions had left with the New Philadelphians decades before, and anyone remaining was a hardliner like the unforgiving Romelius Baker. The society did not want to forcibly expel Poist. The Nocturne incident was still too fresh in everyone's mind. First, they politely asked him to resign. When he refused... They made life and economy so uncomfortable for the Foists that they had no choice but to resign. And not just Benjamin, but his entire family, his mother, brother, and sister. It will be the last major incident of Romelius Baker's trusteeship. He passed away on January 13, 1868. At the time of his death, the membership of the society stood at 140 people. Baker's zeal had protected the society through dark days, but not even he could save its members from the ravages of time.
With Baker's death, Jacob Henrizzi was promoted to senior trustee, and Jonathan Lenz was selected to be the new junior trustee. Lenz had been born in Harmony in 1807, uh, the one in Pennsylvania, that is, and was the only surviving society member who had lived in all three settlements. Lenz was a good man, but he was a caretaker, not a leader. It was Henrizzi's society now. Benjamin Feucht thought Henrizzi's ascension was the beginning of the end. He wrote, Now Baker has died, and the entire direction of the society still depends on Henrizzi, and as soon as he dies, the entire society will dissolve, because no one will be found who knows anything, especially since the entire Council of Elders consists only of fools and blockheads. He probably should have added Henrizzi to his list of fools. Henrizzi was at least a holy fool. Anyone who ever met Jacob Henrizzi knew that he lived as Christ commanded. He was warm-hearted, trusting, kind, and forgiving, a man who practiced what he preached, and generous to a fault, a man who would give you the shirt off his back and the shoes off his feet. Indeed, Henrizzi rarely saw a charitable cause that he could refuse. He gave so freely to worthy causes that every religious order and communal group thought that he might secretly be one of their own. One thing Henrizzi was not, though, was a businessman. He did not keep careful accounts of his transactions or understand basic economic principles. He was happy to do deals with a gentlemanly handshake and to forgive debts rather than insist upon their repayment. Probably the best example of how poorly he managed things was the case of the Beaver Falls Cutlery Company. Now, the society had purchased the cutlery company in 1867 and retooled it to mass-produce cutlery on a grand scale. Uh, perhaps too grand, as unsold inventory soon started piling up in warehouses. When the company's managers approached Henrizzi about halting production until they could work through the backlog of unsold goods, Henrizzi chided them for depriving workers of their livelihood. A beautiful sentiment to be sure, one we should all aspire to, but also foolish. Much of the cutlery ultimately proved unsaleable and sat in storage, slowly rusting and racking up enormous warehousing fees. Still, the company kept plugging away and managed to eventually turn a profit, at which point the workers decided to strike for higher wages. The company managers fired them all and brought in 200 Chinese workers to take their place. That was an unpopular move, and to make matters worse, the people of Beaver Falls met the Chinese workers with violence. Though the society had little to do with day-to-day -day operations of the company, their reputation was now being severely tarnished by the association. In the end, the society made huge donations to charity to offset the bad publicity. They also wound up withdrawing almost all of their investment from Beaver Falls, which damaged its economy and took a long time for the city to recover. Now, had Henrizzi been a hands-on investor or a better businessman, the entire tragedy might have been avoided. Thankfully, the Raps and Bakers had left the society's finances in a solid place that had enabled it to survive Henrizzi's missteps. The most solid financial footing, though, was no defense against old age. In December 1889, Gertrude Rapp died. Trustee Jonathan Lenz died soon after in January 1890. At the time, the society had only 20 members. After Lenz's death, Ernst Wolfel was promoted to be the new junior trustee, but he passed away unexpectedly in July 1890. At the time, the society had 38 members. How had they nearly doubled their membership in just under six months? It had been obvious to all for some time that the society needed new blood. Henrizzi, in particular, wanted to ensure that the society would endure to shepherd the good works he had begun. He turned to someone who had been groomed for years to lead the society into the future. He turned to Benjamin Feucht. In February 1890, the Feucht family was readmitted to the society. It was not a popular move. Other members viewed the Feuchts with suspicion. They thought that Feuchts could not be trusted to uphold the society's principles, that the Feuchts were only interested in gaining access to the society's money, and that the Feuchts held the rest of them in contempt. Those suspicions were correct. The Feuchts did hold the other society members in contempt. Benjamin had once written in his diary that the other Harmony Society members were nice people, but that they did not live, but vegetate. He and his mother had flagrantly violated the society's principles and escaped the consequences each time. And as later events would show, they were only in it for the money. And now the Feuchts were being brought back and being groomed to take over the society's leadership. Well, that could not stand. A faction within the society violated custom by admitting several new members in January, a month before the Feuchts. These new members were a small group of the society's longtime associates who were carefully chosen to balance out any influence the Feuchts could exert on the trustees and elders, and it had included Moritz J. Friedrichs, J. Jacob Niklaus, Herman Fischern, and John S. Duss. Since moving to economy, the society had always had numerous employees and hangers-on living nearby. They often outnumbered the society members by a significant margin, and were so integrated into the community that it was hard for outsiders to know who was a society member and who wasn't. Now, the Duss family were long times hangers-on. 
John Estes was born in 1860. His father had died during the Battle of Gettysburg, and his mother had found employment with the society as a nurse. John had been educated in the society's schools, but he left after reaching adulthood to marry Susanna Creese and start a farm in Nebraska. Though Dust would later claim that the farm was a successful enterprise, records seem to indicate that it was kept afloat primarily through the boundless largesse of Jacob Henrizzi. The Dusses had tried several times to join the society, but Henrizzi did not think they were a good fit. He correctly intuited that they were less interested in the religious mission of the society and more in the creature comforts that the society's wealth could provide. But the Dusses were charming and persistent. In 1888, Duss's mother was ultimately admitted to the society, and later that year, John was brought back from Nebraska to teach at Economy School. Duss used that position to worm his way into Henrizzi's inner circle. When Wolfel died suddenly in July 1890, the Duss faction used John's three weeks of seniority over Benjamin Feucht to elect him as the new junior trustee. Due to Henrizzi's declining health, Duss was effectively in charge. The next three years were a bitter battle between the Dusses and the Foists for control of the society, or rather, for the control of the society's money, since neither group cared a whit about the religious side of the society. Duss, though, had secret allies in the society's lawyers and business partners. For years they had observed how poorly Henrizzi had managed affairs, and dreamed about what they could do with the society's land, business holdings, and financial resources. They brought Duss in as a useful idiot who thought himself to be their equal. With him on the board, they could finally strip the society for parts and make a fortune with its underutilized assets. He also had secret allies in the form of Dr. Cyrus Reed Teed. Teed had founded a cult called the Koreshian Unity, which also believed in celibacy and communal living. Now, the Koreshians also believed that God was a hermaphrodite, that Teed was the Messiah, and that the earth was hollow when we all lived on the inner concave surface, but that's neither here or there right now. We're going to cover that in a future episode, if you're curious. Like other communes before them, the Koreshians were interested in merging with the Harmony Society. Only they were prepared to bring it about by subterfuge. Teed sent agents to insinuate themselves into Economy's community, join the society, and influence the elders to turn its wealth over to Teed. These agents included Teed's brother Oliver and longtime supporter Henry Silverfriend. And they may have included John S. Duss, who had known Teed for years. Now, when Koreshian defectors outed the plot in late 1891, there was a huge uproar. Teed's agents were run out of town, and the proposed merger never came to pass. Years later, Duss would defend himself against the charges of collaboration in his biography. He claimed that he had given money to Teed's communes in the spirit of unity and charity, which had likewise motivated his predecessors to support movements like the Shakers and the Zorites. He did not believe that Teed was a messiah or fully understand the Koreshian's religious beliefs but he absolutely 100% supported their amazing scientific discovery that the Earth was hollow and that we live on the inside. All right, needed a moment there, sorry. Uh, let's give Dust more credit than that, though. It's likely that he never had any intention of turning the society over to Teed. But by working with Teed, Dust could keep the other members of the society focused on a non-existent external threat while he worked on more important long-term goals. Goals like getting rid of the foists. On April 25th, 1892, Duss and his allies hastily called a meeting of the Council of Elders and voted 8 to 1 to expel Henry Feucht from the society. The only nay vote was cast by Henrizzi, who had been dragged out of his sickbed to attend the meeting. In fact, the mild-mannered and genteel Henrizzi became visibly upset when he learned why he had been summoned and angrily castigated the other elders and then stormed out of the room. The Duss faction retaliated by making an attempt to oust Henrizzi himself on June 13th. They had overplayed their hand, though, and the motion failed. Even the Duss's own lawyers told him to cut it out. On July 28th, the elders even reversed themselves and readmitted Henry Feucht, thanks in part to Henrizzi's heartfelt pleadings and the threat of a lawsuit. While the Feuchts would not have Jacob Henrizzi to shield him for much longer. Henrizzi was sick, and his profligate charity and lackadaisical business practices had left the society short of ready cash. The trustees even had to mortgage the entire town of economy for $400,000, that's $11 million in today's money, to meet their financial obligations. To accomplish this, the other society members signed a legal document giving the trustees sole power of attorney over financial affairs, rendering the Council of Elders entirely superfluous. 33 society members signed, only three did not, all of them foists. In December 1892, Henrizzi died. Samuel Cyber was elected the new junior trustee, but he was a non-entity whose primary qualification that he was a friend of John Duss and not a Feucht. From here on out, sole control of the society rested in the hands of John Duss. 
the Foists decided to strike immediately. In February 1893, they filed a suit in the Beaver County Courts asking for the Harmony Society to be put in receivership. The suit alleged a number of disturbing things. That the society was mismanaged both financially and spiritually. That the society was no longer being run as a religious organization, but as a weird combination of investment club and tontine. That Henrizzi's signature had been forged on documents while he was in ill health. That Samuel Cyber had been made a member and trustee in violation of the society's laws and traditions. That the society's principles of equality had been abolished, and that Duss was living in luxury while the other members continued to live like peasants. That Duss had sold some of the society's stocks and assets and pocketed the money for himself. That John S. Duss had fallen under the sway of heretics like Director Cyrus Reed Teed and Prince Michael K. Mills. Now, these are disturbing allegations, if you're writing an op-ed condemning the state of the society in the local paper. They are not legal arguments. The Foists produced witness after witness, affidavit after affidavit, trying to sway public opinion. But they were unable to present a clear argument as to what the courts were supposed to do to rectify the situation, or why the courts should even be involved in the first place. For Duss's part, he had one resource he could use to shut down the Foists, access to the society's accountants. He produced detailed records showing that the society had $600,000 in debts and only about $800,000 in assets. That spooked the Foists, who settled out of court on June 30th in exchange for $28,000 and a plot of land in nearby Stowe Township. In doing so, the Foists proved what their critics had said all along. They were only in it for the money. What the Foists did not realize is that the accounts thus presented were highly selective. They excluded many of the society's assets, including their highly valuable real estate holdings and their secret stash of bullion. When those were factored in, the society was still worth millions. Now, that doesn't mean the society wasn't in trouble. It wasn't bankrupt, though accounts often present it in this way. What the society had was a liquidity crisis. Most of their money was tied up in stock, real estate, and other assets. They could have easily sold off some of those to eliminate their debts, but that takes time, and Henrizzi had stubbornly refused to do so. Duss, on the other hand, had no such scruples. Throughout 1893, 13 people left the Harmony Society. By the end of the year, there were only 21 members left. The Foishs were gone, obviously. A number of old-timers passed away. But a shocking number of the departures were seat fillers who had been admitted to the Society along with Duss in 1890. Since Duss held supreme power, he didn't need them on the Council of Elders anymore, and most were happy to take a $5,000 payout to withdraw and go on their merry way. That meant more lawsuits, though, this time followed by members who had withdrawn from the society earlier and hadn't received such generous payouts. Duss also had to deal with an international lawsuit launched by George Rapp's relatives in Germany, who didn't seem to understand the concept of incorporation and thought the society's properties had been owned by Rapp personally. Dealing with these suits put the society in an unusual legal position. At times, they presented themselves as a corporation, at other times a trust, and at still others as a charity. These are not interchangeable under the law. As opposing counsel George Shires III once noted, Either the retiring members have no right to take large sums of money, and trustee Duss has no right to give it to them, or if he and them have such rights, no trust exists. That is plain. If there is a trust they cannot divide up, and if there is no trust, then the process should be divided among all those who are living, who are members of the trust, and all the heirs of dead members. These cases went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, which ultimately held that the society was not a trust and upheld lower court rulings that members had indeed proactively signed away all their rights to any share of the society. And John S. Duss decided to celebrate the ruling by going crazy, Broadway style. Duss had always loved music and played an economy's band. When he took over the society, he appointed himself conductor, rechristened the group the Duss Concert Band, and packed it with some of the finest musical talent Pittsburgh had to offer. He even got them to play some of his own compositions, like a musical rendition of the Battle of Manila Bay. The Dust Band came to the attention of impresario R.E. Johnston, who offered them a contract for a New York engagement in the summer of 1902. Dust kicked off the season with a concert at the Metropolitan Opera House before moving to the St. Nicholas Gardens. It was an elaborate show featuring a full orchestra, flower girls, perfume fountains, and scantily clad showgirls. Well, at least until Mrs. Dust objected and then the showgirls were canned. He spent over $100,000 promoting his shows, which included lavishly bribing reporters and critics, hiring a dwarf and two giants to wander around Times Square handing out handbills, and even ginning up fake lawsuits. He drew huge crowds, most of them attracted by the spectacle rather than the music. 
After the summer engagement, the band went on a whirlwind tour of Utica, Syracuse, Toronto, Buffalo, Jamestown, Pittsburgh, Baltimore, Newark, and Boston. Outside the New York area, though, the Dust Band shows weren't nearly as well attended, mostly because he couldn't saturate the local market with advanced media. You also started to get honest reviews of Dust's talents, which were not flattering. It turns out he was a subpar conductor who fancied self-aggrandizing Victor Borgia theatrics. The orchestra essentially had to conduct itself. Thankfully, it was packed with top-flight talent and could cover for Dust's shortcomings. In April 1903, the remaining eight members of the Society met. They signed a document reaffirming Dust's supreme powers. Then three of them immediately resigned for a nice fat withdrawal payment of $75,000. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of inflation. Anyways, Dust accepted this vote of confidence, and then on May 12th, he resigned from the Society to focus on his music career full-time. That uh, leaves four members left, by the way. He was also paid $500,000 to withdraw. He didn't really care about the society anymore, and why should he? He was the Justin Bieber of 1902. Besides, his wife Susie was the new trustee, so he still had access to all of the society's assets should he need them. Dust returned to Broadway in 1903 and took advantage of a moment of internal chaos in the Metropolitan Opera to hire away their entire orchestra. He engaged the services of celebrated soprano Lillian Nordica. He booked Madison Square Garden for the entire summer and filled the interior with a replica of Venice made out of paper mache. The spectacle was once again the talk of the town, but it was still obvious that Dust was just gesticulating wildly and wasn't actually calling the shots on stage. It was an apt metaphor for his entire life. Meanwhile, the Harmony Society was winding down. In 1902, an agreement was reached to sell most of economy to the American Bridge Company, who rechristened the community Ambridge and turned it into a company town. The Society's other real estate and business holdings had been liquidated long before. In 1904, Christina Schoenemann died, and in December 1905, Barbara Bosch died. That left the Society with just two members, Susie C. Duss and senile owl old Franz Gilman. On December 13th of that year, Duss and Gilman formally dissolved the Society, splitting the remaining assets between them. And then Gilman immediately gifted his half of the society back to Susie on the condition that she take care of him for the rest of his life. Again, senile old Franz Gilman. And that would have ended the story if it weren't for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. It declared that a religious institution can't have heirs, and so all of the money and land left at the time the trust was dissolved belonged to the state. Now, the argument had some precedent. The Harmony Society had long since expressed similar sentiments. In 1886, Jacob Henrizzi publicly declared, If our belief is a mistaken one, and death should wipe us out before the glorious second coming, it is highly probable that the state of Pennsylvania would be glad to employ our savings as an aid in the payment of our heavy debt. Jonathan Lenz and other members had written letters expressing similar beliefs, and the sentiment was also noted by Richard Owen of New Harmony in his writings back home. Now, the Dusses' defense to this was simple. The Harmony Society was not a religious organization. Gallingly, they were right. Though the Society's articles mention religious instruction, they do not explicitly establish the Society itself as a religious institution. Now, that was implicitly understood by all involved, and even recognized by the United States Supreme Court, but now that it was no longer convenient, Dust was happy to hide behind the letter of the law and discard its spirit. Eventually, the matter was settled out of court. The Dusses kept the money, but Pennsylvania got the property that had been left at the time of dissolution, which included the central core of economy. They preserved it as Old Economy Village, which is still open today as a curious time capsule. The Dusses and Franz Gilman relocated to New Smyrna, Florida, interestingly enough, not too far from Dr. Cyrus Reed Teed and his Koreshian commune. The Dust Band returned to Broadway a few more times, but once John realized he was pissing away his own money, uh, and it was no longer limitless, he put a quick stop to that. The Society's fabulous wealth was gone forever, lining the pockets of Gilded Aid lawyers in Pittsburgh. Franz Gilman died in 1921. Susie Dust died in 1946 and was the only member of the Society to ever be cremated. John Dust died in 1951. And that was the end of the Harmony Society. For a hundred years, they had weathered extreme hardship and every test of their faith to endure and prosper, only to fall prey to greed, pettiness, and internal dissent. They thought they knew what was to come, but no man knows the hour or the day. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee, thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? Though thou exalt thyself as an eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord.
While researching this story, I consulted a number of resources, uh, most notably Carl Arndt's George Rapp's Successors and Material Heirs. I should warn you, though, Arndt was perhaps too close to his subject to tell the story cleanly, and seems to have tempered his recounting of the Society's later days to avoid offending the still-living relatives of some participants. You'll have to do a lot of reading between the lines. And uh, oddly enough, I would heartily recommend John S. Duss's autobiography, The Harmonists, A Personal Remembrance. It's a masterclass in self-deluding pomposity, and it's hard to put down. Seriously, it is a great read, even though you know that the person writing the book is a complete idiot. Oh, uh, connections. Obviously, one of John S. Duss's most popular compositions was a musical rendition of the Battle of Manila Bay. Now, Charles Vernon Gridley was the hero of that battle, and the subject of our Series 1 episode, He Fired When Ready. This episode is the last of our second series. We'll be taking four weeks off, and we'll see you at the end of February with six more episodes. This episode was produced by David White for the Ancient and Esoteric Order of the Jackalope. It is released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 4.0 International License. The script of this episode, along with references, links, and other supporting materials, can be found on our website at orderofthejackalope.com. That's orderofthejackalope.com with hyphens between the words. Follow us on social media to learn more about our release and production schedule. We can be found at Order Jackalope on Instagram, Tumblr, and Twitter. And if you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends. Hey, you! Would you like to join the fastest-growing secret society in the nation? Of course you do. But before you can master the secret knowledge, you must share some secret knowledge of your own. Visit our website at orderthejackalope.com for more information.